Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to go through this talk. I've been thinking a lot recently about, uh, I don't know, what it takes to get people to change their mind and to change how they do things uh, at, at work. And maybe why you should understand that, uh, or maybe why I should understand that uh, there's, there's no need to worry about that. And sometimes and sometimes it's A-OK -okay for people to, uh, to be resistant or not. Uh, but going on, since I work at VMware, uh, I don't know, I have this slide. You can enjoy it. I suggest you print it out and uh, pin it up where while you're brushing your teeth, you can look at it and uh, help you pass the time while you count on each tooth, getting it pearly white. So uh, this is me. I, I noticed I'm wearing the same shirt here, so I must like this shirt. Uh, but I spend a lot of my time, I, I don't know, I probably talk with several hundred sort of managers and executives a year, uh, kind of figuring out how they're getting better at what, how I think about it at doing software, how they're using software in their organization as like the main way they're, uh, they're transacting with customers or running things internally like whatever it may be. I am uh, used to be a software developer and an industry analyst uh, at Red Monk and some other places and did corporate strategy. So I have that, uh, I have that application development uh, kind of little person in the back of my head, always asking, why don't we just do things that would uh, be better around here that would improve the way the organization would work? And what I've gotten into uh, in the past five or seven years is really paying attention to what I would call uh, the meatware, right? So not the software, the hardware, but the you could call it, you know, the people, so the people soft or people wear, things like that. But the way that people think uh, and go about doing things. And that's part of what uh, always attracts me to DevOps and Agile and Cloud Native is so much of it is about... Um, not only changing the tools that people use, but also changing how they, they think about what they're doing. So uh, there's also occasionally some special guest stars since I do stuff from home. There's my dog. We're always the package depot for the block. And we also order a lot of things ourselves. So she, uh, uh, she does thinks our current doorbell is insufficient and so often wants to alert us to that. And then this is my daughter. She's quite a bit older uh, now. Well, it feels like quite a bit older, but every now and then she disagrees with something that I have to say and uh, likes to chime in uh, and go over things. So like I was saying, uh, I spent a lot of time talking with, I guess you could call them change agents at organizations, people who are like, you know, head of transformation or for, for whatever their, their part of IT is, or, you know, sometimes the business they're in, they want to change over to not only doing things in a DevOps way or an agile way, but they want to get to uh, that part, that, that idea that several people have talked about already, where we have the application developers and they can get their software out every week, if not multiple times a day, so that we can start to, as I like to think of it, we can start to program the business. We can experiment and do new things and kind of test out how the organization is running. Again, whether it's external or internal facing. And oftentimes people have some initial success with this uh, and, and it's working well for one or two sort of things. But then they very quickly hit this, uh, this wall where they start saying this, which is, you know, no one wants to change. Like we all know the, as we've gone over as uh, in, in several talks previous to this one, you know, we all know the, uh, what do they call it? The 2B state, the, where we would like to go to. Uh, but we're not quite sure why once we, we show the 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 2b state that the nice agile friendly great sort of environment that we're going to have in the working conditions we keep trying to get people to move over to it and uh, and they don't want to they're very resistant to it which could be frustrating if you've discovered a fantastic tasty new way of thinking and working uh, that no one wants to uh, do things your way and of course no one is hyperbole but you know maybe 90% of people or something like that so when thinking about this problem, uh, you know, I, I used to study a lot of philosophy way back when. And, uh, you know, one of the first things they teach you in, in Western philosophy is kind of the error of, of that. Well, I think of it as the error of that way of thinking that once you've discovered something great uh, and you, you tell people, encourage people to go towards it, they just don't for some reason. And that is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, Plato's cave pictured here. Now, the exciting part of Plato's, Plato's cave right up here, are these people standing on the hill, these are the DevOps people for the purposes of this conference. And they've gone through this cycle of realizing that, you know, there's all these, uh, these illusions that people are doing and, and uh, all sorts of other stuff. And they've gotten enlightened and they've been exposed to the truth. Now, that's not quite the, uh, the DevOps cycle, although I guess you could make some joke about that. But more of the point there is that there's this foundational sort of way of believing 
that once you're shown the truth, once you're shown something good uh, and a better way of doing things, you'll just sort of like follow it. Like here in, in this instance, you know, your, your worldview and your ethics and your morals kind of go in lockstep with the, the truth that you had and you're done. But, you know, that always seemed like a very um, <clears throat> inaccurate way for how, how humans behave, uh, even though it looks cool on paper or papyrus or whatever. Uh, and I'm more, I, I try, I always try to find a picture of this, but I swear I saw a picture of this at some point when I was studying this. I think people and organizations work more like this, which was another uh, I think this was, I forget if it was ancient Greek or Roman, but it was one of the cults or the mysteries. And, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't the old uh, Delphic one, but, you know, they had a practice where they would actually go into a cave. So someone would go down this ladder and there was a hole in a wall and they would stick their head in this hole in the wall from one cave to the next. And then they would have some sort of uh, uh, experience that would reveal the truth to them, some sort of mystic thing that was happening. And, you know, that's obviously... Um, <clears throat> not too rational and a, and a little strange. And that's more of how I more or less observe people thinking about here is a good way of doing things. And am I going to follow it or not? There's a lot less sort of rationality to how they, uh, they decide to follow things or not. So I think that's the first thing when I am talking with people about change resistors, if you will, is I, I try to, you know, uh, move the discussion towards, well, you know, they're not going to change there's many people who aren't who are not going to change just because you've shown them the truth, right? Just because you've, as I always joke about it, you know, you ordered a book, uh, you ordered a box full of DevOps and Agile and product management books, and you just distributed them, and uh, therefore people should switch over to doing things because you've shown them the way out of the cave, uh, and instead, you know, they've got their head stuck in a uh, in a different cave. So. Uh, there's all sorts of models for when you're trying to move from that point, how you, in a large organization especially, go through change. And there's there's many great ones, right? I, that, there's sort of, I sort of have picked some here chronologically ordered. Um, I think the one in the middle, the uh, the Cotter one, is uh, for, comes from a lot of, there's a lot of change study in the 90s, if, if you remember that, or, or read about it. Uh, in your your corporate history books, uh, but there's he uh, you know there's a great system written up there about how management kind of puts together the strategy and as they say rolls out change, and you know there's there's newer things like that the the ad car model uh, that are, are great ways of starting to think about how do I put together this plan as management as executives as that change agent and have some structure around it uh, again a plan or to use the word in the lowercase way a strategy. Uh, that that lets us do that. So I think that's that's a good place to start with. But you know, I think what what usually becomes more of the blocker, and what I'm interested in, is when individuals themselves uh, don't want to go through change. And I think that's where going. You know, we get a we get a little bit closer with a, with a couple of other models of thinking. Right, the uh, the bridges transition model here, which kind of shows people going through. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, the, the the shock of change and the fear of it and kind of slowly, mil you know, going through this uh, this kind of trough, if you will, or, or chasm, however you want to call it. Uh, and then they kind of figure out the new way of doing things and they get more comfortable with it and go through it. And then, of course, there's the uh, the grief acceptance thing. I found this great model of uh, uh, teach someone want not wanting to be a teacher anymore. So it makes it pretty, uh, pretty concrete in there about what going through this this process is. And I think this way of thinking, right, that people are going to go through different stages of hearing they should change, fearing it, building up trust with it, and then also, and then actually doing it. When you're thinking about people who want to resist change, right, that's really the task that you, a change agent, has, is how do I work with these individuals and groups of them that have similar uh, characteristics and are similarly along that curve to kind of move them along that curve, not just put these big change strategies in place or, you know, reorganize things or bring in new tools, all those things that are obviously necessary, but also how do I think about how I'm debugging, if you will, the, the people and, and understanding where they are. Maybe they're not bugged up, but, you know, kind of programming them. All these words sound pretty terrible when it comes to people, but more bringing them along and helping them learn uh, new ways of doing things. So the first thing uh, that, I think is good for understanding their mentality is uh, usually, you know, again, a lot of, especially us on the vendor side, right? Like uh, when we're motivating people uh, to change over and with a lot of the, um, I don't know, managers and executive types that we talk with, 
uh, this kind of motivation tends to work well, that if you're in charge of running an organization or you have a large group that you're working with, there's three, you know, there's three, these are kind of my top three classic ways that you motivate people to change, right? Like tech companies are going to come and like take your business away. You're going to experience some kind of disruption that, you know, makes it imperative uh, that, that you do things or to use another phrase that comes up every now and then there's an existential crisis uh, about we no longer have growth or, you know, valuation in our company. And it's been my experience that like these kind of motivators for individuals, they don't really care. Right. Like they're they're in their job doing their kind of individual work, even at the team level. And they can be interested in uh, some of these aspects. But these are more things that understandably people who are running organizations are concerned with because this is kind of their job to defend against these kind of things. So that motivates them. But it's not a very good way of motivating individuals. So it's fine to kind of mention those things, but I wouldn't use it as a primary way to motivate people. So instead, Let's look at uh, some of the motivations that I see people using that have worked here and there. You know, some of them may not work well and some of them may not apply, but I think it's good to have kind of a, a buffet to, to choose from when you're assembling together uh, how you're going to help individuals uh, change around. So the first one, you know, uh, any discussion of careers and change management uh, and, you know, what people want to do and kind of their life at work. I, I always find it's kind of a personal pet peeve of mine. Maybe it says a lot more about my, uh, my uh, is the word avarice, uh, you know, kind of my, my greed, if you will. But like, there's always this, this discussion of like, oh, you know, money doesn't matter. It's, it's something that uh, there's things that matter more than money, which I think as, as oftentimes is the case. However, you know, I'm always suspicious when people who uh, are giving me money are telling me that it doesn't matter. Uh, or, you know, people who have are well set up and have plenty of money are also saying that it doesn't matter. And in fact, uh, I think clearly it matters a great degree, right? Like it matters that you have the appropriate amount of, uh, of pay and benefits that you're giving people. And I think this is especially true, you know, us and we in the tech industry are very lucky uh, and privileged with the uh, the compensation that we get. But when you go and talk out, when you go and talk with people who are not in the in the tech world, their situation is not quite the same, right? And just to give one example of something that I think is really worth considering when you're encountering people who are resistant to change and thinking about how you might motivate them, um, there's this question of, so you're asking people to go through the risk of changing, right? Anytime you do something new, especially in a corporate context, it's risky, right? Like how is it going to pan out? Like uh, I'm changing from something that works to doing something new. And think about, so if this works out for them, what is it going to be their reward? Do they get anything except being employed, right? Like, is there any actual reward that you're giving them uh, for taking on that risk? Because conversely, right? Like if it doesn't go well, uh, why did they do anything if if they didn't get a reward for it? And now they're uh, now they're in a bad situation. And so we we in the tech world, right? Like we typically get a fair amount uh, or at least some equity in the company, some stock, right? And so we participate in the reward of changing, and it kind of helps us think through like uh, balancing out that risk, right? Now, in talking with people at regular companies, that's always very difficult if they don't already do that. But it is something to start thinking about, right? If you want to be like a tech company, if you want to go through a massive change and really, uh, what's the old phrase? If everyone's a software company, it's good to start thinking about how software companies treat their employees and the structures they use to motivate people. So always start with that as a floor, right? Like what is the compensation? What is the reward I'm giving people uh, as a risk? Not only to motivate them, but like, I don't know, I would argue because it's like ethically correct to uh, have people share in the success that they, they help cause. Now, there are many other things that are the, uh, you know, not money category of things. And uh, you, can, you can pick out all sorts of surveys. Here's a, a very recent one uh, from September, which I believe was last month if my calendar is accurate, uh, from, from McKinsey. And you can kind of, I, I like charts like this because it's always fun to see the uh, difference in perception between management and, and uh, individuals, between the two people involved in, in a, uh, the two sides of any survey, right? So what you see here are rankings of what's important to employees versus ranking of, rankings of what's important to employers and, and the ones that line up and the ones that don't. And indeed, you can see that, uh, you know, compensation isn't like the top gigantic one there. Uh, but 
it, it is of course important. But let, I, I want to look at a look at a few of the things uh, that I do see people uh, non monetary motivations and kind of ways of getting people to be comfortable with and take on that risk of change. So the first one, and this is this is the one that I, I uh, uh, every now and then I have to be reminded of uh, in, instead of other things because uh, it's been so long since I've been a developer, but a lot of what, if you find someone who is resistant to change, particularly technical people, a lot, not, not always, but many, most of, much of the time, people who are in technical roles, whether they're developers or operations people, or even, you know, project managers or, you know, PMs in the non, uh, in, in the non-tech company sense of it, they got into that because they liked learning and they were curious about things. And it was fulfilling to go through that, uh, as we call it nowadays, that inner loop and maybe even the outer loop of figuring out a problem, solving it, and kind of getting that uh, that solution of, of fixing up a problem. So think about, you know, ultimately, if you're changing to something or not ultimately, but one of the main things that if you're changing is you're going through perhaps a painfully long loop, but you're also going through this loop of learning something new. And part of that, uh, as, as several people mentioned, is if you are deploying your software uh, more frequently, right? You're using your software as a way of interfacing, again, internally or externally, the, the developers, sometimes even the operations people, especially if you're following that platform as a product way of thinking that, uh, that Joe was talking about way at the beginning, you get much closer to the people, the users of whatever you're doing, the software, the operation stuff. And it can be very fulfilling to see that, uh, well, I mean, I've actually made a difference, right? Like this coding wasn't just fun for me or this configuring or setting up a platform wasn't fun. It's actually improved things for other people. And, you know, an, another way, you know, another thing, uh, part of all of that, right, is that that speediness of the loop, right? The ability to have a fast path to production or a fast cycle time or however you, pedantic you want to get about the proper phrasing for uh, for cycles in, in lean world. But that's another motivation that you can have to people is like, you know, don't, don't you, uh, isn't it kind of annoying to have to wait three months just to do something or six months or longer? Um, and then finally, you know, there is, uh, there's a lot to be said for avoiding, uh, as we used to call it, gold plating or resume padding. But I was thinking about this recently, and a lot of the organizations I talk with, they desperately want to modernize what they're doing. They're working on five, 10-year-old stacks of technologies and old practices. And to some extent, maybe it's good to use resume padding as an enticement, because really what you're doing is saying, pad your resume out with contemporary skills, right? And so that might be something that's actually good to appeal to people to, rather than just kind of taking it as orthodoxy that like, we should never encourage people to have a better resume. Uh, but in fact, that might be the resume that you want to hire for. So it's fine to sort of uh, maybe not pad, but fill in, uh, if, if you will. Now, next, and this this comes up, uh, has come up a lot uh, frequently, uh, recently. And I think it's something that, uh, you know, is very important to look through as you're going through change, right? Because if you go think about those cycles of change, right, there's a lot of uncertainty and fear, a lot of things like that. And so it's really important to spend a tremendous amount of time making sure people, you know, to, to put it in the most uh, simplest, concise way that they feel safe, right? That they, you know, I think, I think there's two things, obviously, uh, you know, it is worth saying, but if, if there are people who are bullying people or being jerks, right, it's good to find those people out because that's going to not only, in, even if you're not going to change, that's going to mess things up, but it's particularly important to pay attention to that during the difficult time of changing. But one of the things that I think is also worth highlighting, especially kind of at the mid-management level, is oftentimes I see people being asked to change and they're not really given any tools or power or authority to do anything. They're just expected to change. So that's something I would look at as kind of a um, almost a safety issue that if I'm asking someone to do something and I'm asking them to change, do I know what they need to do? Do I know what tools literally or metaphorically they need? And if if I or us, the committee of change or whatever, are not giving them those tools and that authority, I'm not really asking them to do something in a very safe way. I'm asking them to take on a tremendous amount of risk, kind of, you know, uh, jump, you know, climb up a building without the proper uh, safety netting and, and rigging that you would you would need to uh, in case you you fall, which generally people will uh, uh, I always think of failure and learning as a synonym. So as you're changing, you're going to be failing. That is learning new ways of doing things. So you need to have that uh, that safety behind it, the tools that allow you to do it in a safe way. And then finally, when it comes to uh, 
kind of the individuals, right? I think another thing when you're working through uh, motivating people to change, right? They're kind of people who are, I don't know, as we used to say, sticks in the mud, or they have, you know, they have that justified reason of why would they change over. One of the other things to entice people with, and something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, kind of on both sides of this, is I remember I was talking with an Australian uh, colleague of mine a while ago, and they have this great distinction, uh, you can guess which side the Australians tend to be on, of people who either live to work or work to live. And so that's a good way of identifying someone, right? Because someone who lives to work, I mean, maybe you could be judgmental about that being good or bad, but you could, you know, using those fulfillment things I was talking about previously, or how can you entice them with making their work more interesting, right? Making them more interested in, uh, as this person is here in, in the business side of stuff, how can that be the bag of treats uh, and rewards that, that you give them to take, uh, reward that risk and motivate them along? Now, of course, there are many other people uh, who are interested in just working to live, right? Like it's not uh, it's not a huge part of their identity. And, uh, you know, they would probably prefer to do the, uh, you know, the respectable amount of work uh, for uh, the compensation they need for the rest of their life. And I think this set of people I find can be the, I don't know, the majority of people who, who don't want to change. And I, I count myself in this category, so I'm not being judgmental about it. But I think the thing that people often miss uh, from change, because it's almost like a taboo thing to say, is that if we are going to be more productive, right, like we're speeding up release cycles and productivity, um, instead of making you work more because we're more productive, maybe you can do the same amount of work in less time, meaning work less, which again, you're not really supposed to say that out loud in a corporate setting. But if we're going to go through all this change to make you more productive, maybe think about how you take that, um, what would you call it? Is that a dividend? Take that dividend and give that back to employees so that they have more time for uh, living after going through that change. So finally, uh, I think it's important to think, you know, if you're a change agent or a manager, right? Like it's easy to get frustrated at other people, but it's also important to think like, well, am I myself changing, right? And chances are, if you're asking the organization to change and you're not changing, then something's probably going a little askew, right? Something wrong. So oftentimes managers spend a lot of their time in meetings, checking on status of things. And uh, what I would figure out is as you're going through this change, are you having the same type of meetings, the same interactions over and over again, or are you doing different things, right? If you yourself are not doing something different, then you're probably not going through a change and you're not really modeling or even being aware of what it takes to actually go through that change. And certainly people are not going to uh, really trust and follow you if uh, you're sort of uh, not, not walking the walk as it were. Well, with that, uh, thanks. It's uh, it's always fun to talk about these topics. I'll I'll be around and on some panels and uh, playing our, our our games at the end here. But uh, I'm always interested in hearing more and uh, your your thoughts on this. And with that, uh, we'll see everyone next time.